Hey everyone, it's Paul Bunyan DM here. Before we begin, I wanted to thank you all for watching, and I sincerely hope you enjoy this type of content. And if you do, please consider subscribing so that you never miss another video. Also, if you want to leave a like or a comment down below sharing your thoughts on this type of Dungeons & Dragons content, I'd really appreciate it. You know I love to hear from you guys. Thank you so much, and please enjoy this story of an encounter with a brass dragon. The Great Arnok Desert, an ocean of scorching hot sand and rock smack dab in the middle of Faerun. The Great Sand Sea, they call it, and for good reason. Getting lost out there is too damned easy. Not to mention all the danger. Sandstorms, packs of rabid animals, quicksand, rogue earth elementals, all wrapped up in a neat little bow of extreme heat and complete lack of water. Still, many caravans travel across this ocean of sand and danger, all for the promise of wealthy trade. Me and my own team of mercenaries got hired out as an escort for one of these caravans. They're the property of some high-born fat cat out of Waterdeep, carrying a large shipment of halfling pipeweed, sun drop, and other intoxicating substances. Though officially it's carrying herbs and spices. Black market jobs can be risky, but they pay good money and free rations. Not to mention a trip across the Arnok Desert, so my mates and I didn't complain. But now we had to find a guide. After some looking, we were met with a young man, looked like a poet type, with brass eyes, brown hair tucked underneath a fancy feather cap. He wasn't nothing special, scrawny and about five and a half feet tall. The boys and I were suspicious, figuring him for a thief, con man or a honey trap set by bandits, but the caravan leader wasn't having any of it. He wanted to be off soon, so we accepted the poet's offer. The next morning we set off, guarding a half dozen covered wagons pulled by camels. The drivers and caravan leader got to stay in their cozy and shaded wagons while the rest of us rode camels, horses, or slogged it on foot. The sun was beating on me like I was a drum and I could feel my skin getting red and cracked. The vultures circling over our heads were making me nervous. Hell, keeping a lookout was hard enough with all the loud wind, the heat mirages, and that laughter coming from the head of the caravan. That's where the leader and our guide were sitting all day. Oh, that little prick. He must love the sound of his own voice. He would talk all hours of the day and all hours of the night. Stories, jokes, quotes from books and plays. Ugh, he never shut up. On the fourth night, we made camp. My boys were exhausted, but we couldn't get much sleep as we had guard duty. I glared at the one person I didn't want to see that night, even less than bandits or wild animals, our guide. He came strolling right up onto me, deciding he was going to annoy me personally tonight. Greetings, my good fellow. All clear tonight? Sounded like he already knew the answer, the cocky little shit. For now, you never know when an attack is going to come through. They always come out at night in the desert. Oh, trust me, I know. It reminds me of a story. The terrible Knoll warlord Gortung, who ambushed and slaughtered a caravan twice the size of... Look here, kid, I've got a job to do, so why don't you just go bother the cook or something? The poet gave me a disappointed look, like I took his toy away. But eventually he shut up and went back to his tent. Not before annoying each of my men in turn, that is. This damn pattern went on and on every night. The boy would come over and bother me or my men with jokes and stories no one asked for, never leaving us alone no matter how much we threatened him. Of course, maybe it's because he knew the caravan leader lacked him so much. Every time we threatened to knock the boy's lights out, he'd stop us and threaten to dock our pay. Even saying that if we just appreciated some good conversation, then we wouldn't be so mad at him. Gods help me, but if bandits attack this caravan, I might just help them. On the eighth day as the sun was rising, the caravan pulled into a canyon. I was against going this way from the start. Canyons are death traps. Only one narrow path in and out, rocky walls that could hide archers or flying monsters. It's the perfect spot for an ambush. But our yapping little guide, oh, he was sure this was the best way. Said it would get us to the west edge of the Great Desert a whole two days sooner. So, of course, that's the way the caravan leader said we were going. Me and my men were on high alert, ready for anything. 
trying not to think of that poet's smug face. But this canyon was all quiet, save for a few birds. Then the caravan came to a sudden stop after I nearly fell into a well. That's right, a well, filled with fresh water. Me and the boys drank our fill, and thankfully it weren't poisoned or nothing, but this didn't sit right with me. This well weren't natural. Someone or something dug it out. Oh good, we're here. The scrawny poet jumped out of the head wagon and strutted about like he owned the place. It took us long enough. You can put those weapons down now, big fellow. Nothing will attack us in my home. At this point, I'd had enough. So I grabbed that scrawny little punk by the throat and held a blade to it, threatening to cut him open and dunk him into the well if he didn't tell us exactly what was going on. You know how folks say, be careful what you wish for, cause you might get it? Well, I got my wish. I got to see who this poet really was. In a flash of magic, he turned from a scrawny little bastard into an honest-to-God's dragon. He was tall as an elephant, with rough scales of brass, a large bony frill on the sides of its head, bulky muscles and wings that stretched out like a giant fan from its shoulders all the way to its tail. My men and I tried to bring our weapons to bear, though to be honest, we were also debating running away, not wanting to be slaughtered. The dragon just gave us a disappointed sigh. Oh, you are terrible listeners. I said put the weapons away. Nothing will harm you, least of all myself. I'm a brass dragon, not some violent blue. I don't want to eat you or take any of your gold. I just want to talk. I want to hear your stories and tales, and I'll tell you all of mine in turn. Hearing this, I started to worry if the dragon was not going to let us go. I looked around my men, then my eyes landed on the caravan leader, and I got an idea. Now hold on now, uh, dragon. My boys and I, we ain't very good talking company. Matter of fact, we'd be, uh, boring. Real boring. So you should take, uh, him, the caravan leader. You let us go, and let us take some of the herbs and spices off this cargo, and maybe a camel or two, and we'll leave you alone with the most interesting person in the caravan. The dragon brought its claws up to its chin, thinking a moment. Do I get anything else out of this? Well, uh, we could bring you another caravan, full of all kinds of folk that like to talk and got interest in stories, just like you. We can bring them here and say, one month? The dragon smiled, showing huge, sharp teeth. It's a deal. I will see you in one month, my friend. And you? You and I have much to talk about. I watched as the dragon scooped up the caravan leader in one large, clawed hand. It climbed up the rocky canyon wall like it was a set of stairs, and made its way into a cave entrance, halfway up the wall. All the way up, the caravan leader was yelling at me and my men, saying how he paid us to protect him and we had to get him out from the dragon's claws. But we're just brutes. Me and my boys don't know anything about negotiating with dragons. We laughed as we rode out of that canyon, hearing that brass dragon's voice on the wind. Funny. I actually kind of like that sound now.